Welcome to Seen and Heard. Hey! <laughs> this is the podcast where Jackie and I normally go through the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. But this week we have a very special episode. This is our favorite films. This is our top 10 favorite films from last year, from 2022. We each have 10. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they are. We've mm -mm. kept them secret from each other. And we're going to work our way. As best we, we can, we've kept them secret. Yes. Like, I'm sure I probably know a couple that are on your list. Same. I don't know where they're on your list, like, but at some point. So we realize this episode is coming out on Tuesday the 24th. We, however, are recording it several days before today, when you're listening to it right now. Um, we know today is Oscar noms day, but we wanted to give our top 10 before the nominations came out. Just so we're not clouded by any, I don't know. It's nomination. pure, baby. Yeah, exactly. It is pure. So I'm really excited about that. I am excited to hear by by this time, when when you are listening to this, you will know the Oscar nominations. But um Well, and if you're listening, you know, five years from now, you won't give it, a shit what yeah, the Oscar that's noms also are. True. That's also true. Because something but, like Green Book will have won and everyone will have forgotten it the second yeah, after it won. And Coda. <laughs> yeah. Um sorry. We're I'm you know what? We made a resolution to not be as mean to <laughs> <laughs> to movies we're well, not not to movies but yeah i guess sometimes we get personal about filmmakers or i get personal <laughs> i guess it's all on me actually um, i tr i mean yeah but um, yeah in, you, in all fairness i've never seen green book you've never seen it no i just do i need to no <laughs> exactly i don't know uh, yeah i always kind of feel bad like dragging a movie that i haven't seen but yeah well i'm excited to hear the nominations um they should be interesting I kind of have a feeling I know. Should we wait? Should we guess right now what's going to be before we know? I don't know. That's it's tough. Do you think you can guess? Yeah, I have a few I know for sure. Okay, I'll yeah. You list yours, and I'll say if I agree or disagree. Fablemans. Yes. Um, Tar. Yes. I heard a lot of All Quiet on the Western Front talk because the BAFTAs um the BAFTA nominations actually came out like a few days ago oh yeah um so maybe that one I could honestly maybe see that that kind of came out of nowhere the yeah. academy does love a good war story yeah so I I'm predicting that one honestly I'm predicting the whale I yes, think it might for sure which is um what else what else what else what else I think Banshees will be on there you think Banshees? Yes, I think Banshees. I think Banshees as well. will be up for Best Picture. And you think Everything Everywhere? Yes. You think Armageddon Time? I think Armageddon Time. Yeah, I've heard a, the buzz around Armageddon Time is very strong. So yeah, I could see that. Those too. are our predictions. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see if they're <laughs> true. You guys are all gonna think we cheated because you're listening to this on the day the nominations came out. But I swear to you, this is a few days before. Yeah. Um, I think Triangle of Sadness for Best Foreign Film. Yeah. I think so. What else for foreign? Decision to leave, probably. Hopefully. Right. It'll be nominated for sure. Um, Corsage? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. I guess time will tell. Well, we should say. So, yeah, we're keeping it nice and kind of loose this episode. So, we're not going to have our traditional structure that we mm. employ for most episodes. It's just going to be us going through our lists. But we do want to say, I do want to put a disclaimer out there that neither of us are full time film critics and we don't have the time to see everything and we don't get released. screeners we so don't if you're screeners. listening and you have access to screeners send it to us honestly yeah <laughs> put us on your list i want to receive screeners yeah so you know we haven't seen everything like we jackie and i i know i can speak for both of us in saying we tried to see as much as possible <laughs> so that we could feel confident enough to feel somewhat authoritative in giving a top 10 and just saying like it's not like i saw 12 movies this year and i'm just gonna rank the ones i've seen like exactly. you know we saw as much as we could I and tried. this is our 10 yeah very very well spoken greg well do you want to say jackie maybe some of the ones that you didn't get to yet that yeah i still haven't seen uh saint omer same um very excited to see that return to soul which isn't out yet but oh, it's that? about um it's about a French woman who is Korean who returns to Seoul. Oh, I think okay. She was born in Korea and then she was adopted by a French family and she comes back home, but apparently it's really good. Um I don't know when it's coming out uh in the US. The Woman King, I haven't seen. I really wanted to. Uh Marcel the Shell with shoes on oh, that I was never good. saw. 
Armageddon time. I really want to see. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I want to see Till. I never saw it. Yeah, I think that's my that's my. Um, I think you did better than I did. What do you mean? <laughs> Just I think you saw you managed to see a little bit more than me. I really went hard. Yeah. Uh, this last week, <laughs> I'm banking those AMC box. stubs. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Well, we should say too that by the, so if a movie's on our list, I, we should specify as a 2022 film. It had to have been released in the U.S. in 2022 because some of these are technically from 2021 that were maybe released in other countries first, and then we got them in 2022. So that was the criteria we used. So Greg, I know you used that criteria. Oh, but, you didn't. Well, uh, we'll <laughs> see. I'll, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh no! Wait. No, go ahead. So the big ones I didn't see. I did not see Decision to Leave. I love mm. Park Chan Wook. I'm like very excited to see it. it. I just ran out of time. I also ran out of time to see R R R, which I oh know. Oh my god, R R R. Yes, me too. People are flipping out about. I know. I can't wait. I think I just every time I'd see it, it's like oh, it's three very hours. Long. Yeah. yeah, but I'm very excited to see it. I didn't see Two Leslie, the Andrea Riseborough movie, which... Yeah, what the heck is going on? Yeah, no, I heard my friend Sue, who is actually the one that told me about housekeeping, she really liked this and told me I needed to see I it. I really want to see that as well. But you know, you heard about this whole like campaign that's going on like out of nowhere. No. Oh, you don't know about this? No, I don't. All these actresses, like seemingly out of nowhere, I think on Monday, started like randomly posting saying like... This is the best performance ever captured to celluloid. You have to see this movie. This is like, you have to, you have to. It's the best performance, best performance. Oh, wow. Kate Winslet, um, a lot others that are not coming to me, but Kate Winslet was the one that like ignited it. And then all these actresses followed. Oh, wow. That's so cool. But it's like very random. I love Andrea Riseborough. And I feel like she has not been given her sort of like big, big break yet. I want to see it. And like... Yeah, I think most people would probably know her from Mandy, which Mm -hmm. even, um, you know, I loved her in a film I saw at Sundance in 2020 called Luxor. And it was actually my favorite thing I saw at Sundance that year. And then I think distribution just kind of, I don't know who got it, but like, I never heard from it again. I've never heard anyone else that saw it. Is it about the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas? No, no. <laughs> like she goes to Egypt. It's oh, kind of like a Egypt. it's oh. kind of like a lost in translation in oh, Egypt almost. Cool. That's kind of like underselling what it is, but it's kind of that. Okay. But I really liked it and she's really good. She's such an interesting actor. Oh yeah, and, we gotta uh, see. What's the movie called? To Leslie. Yeah. I also didn't see women talking. Mm, I love Sarah Polly. We just did her film for the film club. Well, like half a year ago we did um stories we tell which Mm -hmm. was great and i Mm -hmm. this is i really want to see this i just didn't get around to it especially as of the time of recording it's only theatrical uh i didn't see eo Mm. captain eo no i didn't see eo captain eo because again just short on time and to be completely frank i'm not a big al hazard balthazar fan as if you've heard our episode on that movie would know i'm not a big fan of that film so I was not in a hurry to see EO because it's essentially, it sounds like a meditation on Balthazar. Modern Balthazar. Yeah. I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it. I just ran out of time. I actually think you'd really like it. I didn't see Armageddon time. I think that's both of us. And then the last big one is I didn't see both sides of the blade. This is the Claire Denis film. So those are the movies we didn't see. So take that into account when we list our favorite films. Uh, Yes, but we, uh, you know, I still would like to see most of those, if not all, and we can report on them in subsequent episodes. Do you want to give runners up now or at the end? Yeah, let's do it now. Let's do it like an honorable mention. Honorable mention. Once you start, yeah. Here we go. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. I this is a movie where I saw it again. It was at like peak popularity, where everyone was like, "This is the greatest movie of all time," and so I went in like. And I really liked it. I I loved so much about it and I had a really good time. But overall, I feel like I really need to give it a rewatch before I can like really place it on my list. So I do want to give it an honorable mention because I love seeing Kie Kwan everywhere at the awards. I love Michelle Yao. They're all the whole cast is incredible. And I just yeah. That's one of my honorable mentions because I feel like it is a movie I want to rewatch. Like I want to rewatch it with my family. Like I, it's that type of movie. And for that, I am very grateful. Um, after Yang, which I saw yesterday, it's the new film by Koganada. Uh, I really Is it a second it. film? 
Yes. Did you like Columbus? I never saw it. You know what? I did not connect with it. Really? Yeah. And I was like very excited to see it too. You might like After Yang. It's very, I don't know. I feel like I jam packed all these movies and this was like the last one I saw and I really, really did like it, which is why I'm giving it an honorable mention. Um, it was just missing like one little thing that I can't really put my finger on, but a lot of really touching moments. It's about basically a family um, in the near future. And they have an AI sibling for their adoptive daughter. And he shuts down and his name is Yang. And it's basically Colin Farrell. He's the dad. And he's trying to uh, get Yang fixed. But they can't really do it. And the daughter's really sad. And it's really, really sweet. It, it really, really was. I, I really, really liked it. And another honorable mention, uh, Women Talking. Because I really, I mean, it's very hard to pick a top 10. It truly is. I saw women talking last week and I just want to say, I think Claire Foy's performance is like wonderful. I'm really hoping for an Oscar nom for her because she's fantastic in it. Um, Jesse Buckley as well, but I feel like Claire Foy really, there's something about Claire Foy in this movie that's really, really special. And overall, I did like it. I think it was really um, interesting in that it was like, it really is just women talking for two hours. And um, yeah. I don't want to give much away, but I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? What? No, it's like I, I really liked it. I just, again, like these, these honorable mentions are all movies that I really, really enjoyed, but there was just something that I can't quite put my finger on of like why they didn't. It's so hard creating a list. Well, no, that's true. Sometimes it is like an indescribable thing yeah. because the, the films that go on your list are the films that you feel this like fire about. There's yeah, like, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, you should definitely watch it because it's great. And I saw Nope like two days ago. I really, really enjoyed it. I think it was really fun. I really love the mystery in it. Like, I love how, like, that shoe thing is never explained. And I love how, I don't know, the monster is so, like, elusive and strange and, like, something you've never seen. And I love how it's not really explained. Like, we talked about in um, in our 2001 episode how we like when, like, sci-fi things are not like there's no techno babble and i really liked that about this movie kind of like a twilight zone episode i thought it was yeah. a real i wish i saw it like in the summer with a full crowd and it was like my summer blockbuster i didn't unfortunately cuz i didn't have stubs back then <laughs> but if i did i would have and maybe it would have made the top top 10 but honorable mention it was great um yeah i saw it on mine. a plane yeah that yeah that's kind of First of all, that would freak me the fuck out. If I saw that on a plane, I would freak out. Oh, be eh, no, no, no. I would get very scared. Um, yeah. Cool. What are your honorable mentions? Yeah, so I have a few. Again, I really liked all of these. And at, I think at some point, all of these films were in my top 10. And then the more I saw, they kind of like got bumped off. But they're very, very close. Um, so the first one I have is Apollo 10 and a half, which is the, ri oh, yeah. the, the Richard Linklater film. So... This is the only film, I think, wait, I'm looking through my top 10 list. Yeah, it's the only film this year that I saw twice. And wow. I think because I saw it and I was like, first of all, I was like in a bad, I woke up in a funk one day and just was not feeling it. I was just like kind of depressed and I started the movie and it just like completely changed. It was it's such a ray of sunshine. And yeah, I really liked the movie. It, it was on my list and I really wanted to make it work on my list. Uh but it just didn't quite. And I think people, a lot of people didn't see it because Netflix kind of just dumped it out and it's a new Richard Linklater film. It's great. It's my favorite of his in a long time. Probably my favorite since like before midnight. Yeah. Uh, I really liked Pearl, the Ty West film. Mia Goth, so good in this. Um, really great kind of absurdist character piece. Again, it kind of loses the horror of X. X is kind of this throwback slasher movie, which I enjoyed. But I think Pearl takes it to the next step. I think Pearl is a more interesting film. It's a it's a deeper film. It's a funnier film. Mia got, and they're going to make a third one, Maxine. Or they shot all three at the same time. So I'm looking forward to that. But I really liked Pearl. And again, a testament to just Mia Goth, like how great she is. Mm -hmm. I really liked. You're going to laugh. We saw this together. Bones and, <laughs> Bones and all. I really liked it too. Actually, that's an honorable mention for me too. I really wanted to get this on my top 10 because <laughs> I really dug this movie. 
and it just didn't quite make it again because I had other films. That... It's really hard making this list. It's hard. Yeah. It's, you know, but it's the kind of, you know, like I'll buy the Blu-ray, you know, like I really enjoyed the yeah. movie. I just like at the end of the day, there were, you know, 10 other films I liked more, slightly more. Um, I really liked We're All Going to the World's Fair. Oh, me too. This was one. So I saw this and I think I was expecting something a little bit more straightforward horror. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of taken aback when I saw it. Like, whoa, this isn't what I expected at all. But it stayed with me. So I think, totally. like, I first saw it, I was, like, slightly disappointed. And then, like, I keep, especially that ending, which mm -hmm. we're not going to give away. But you know what I'm talking yeah. about. And I was like, whoa. Like, what? A, it's a fascinating movie. If it you is. have not seen We're All Going to the World's Fair. Like, very, very cool movie. A lot of the images, like, yeah, they return to me at random moments. Yeah. It's pretty striking. It is. Yeah. Uh, two more. I have Bardo, which I just saw today. Ooh. I saw it this morning. That was the last one I squeezed in before this episode. Yeah, it's like just short of three hours long. I didn't think I was going to like this film because I think Inuritu has been getting increasingly more indulgent. Like, I really like Birdman. I like, you know, his earlier films. The Revenant's okay. And then I, I feel like he kind of was like, he's just, he's, he's so indulgent. And so I saw the trailers for this. And I was like, fuck this movie. Like, it looks just like some Fellini wannabe shit. But you know what? I actually really enjoyed it. It was very close to making the top 10. It just didn't quite do it. But I liked it so much more than I thought. And it was so much more. I mean, yes, it's narcissistic. It's his ver It's it totally. is his eight and it a half. It is eight and a half. But it's much more kind of profound and thoughtful and introspective, I guess, than I kind of thought. It's like the spectacle isn't the trailer makes it look so Fellini-esque. And it's not quite that. And so I, yeah. I really enjoyed it. And then the last one I'll say is Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Nice. Which, again, was super cute. It's it's just a great time. Uh, Isabella Rossellini voices one of... It's Jenny Slate and Isabella Rossellini, basically, as a, a mother and daughter shell. <laughs> I have to Or no, Marcel's it. a boy, I guess. Sorry. But uh, yeah, great. It's really good. It's really good. So that was close. Didn't quite make it. Those are my honorable mentions. Yeah. <laughs> is that too many? No, that's great. <laughs> Um, before we get into it, I feel like if you had to define the movies of this year in like one sentence, what would it be? Oh God. Like what's the biggest theme you saw? I, I mean, I, it's kind of obvious, like this whole, each filmmaker kind of making like the movie they want to make in a way, a lot of the times about filmmaking. I mean, we have the Fables. Actually, yes. We have Babylon, even Bardot, like for sure, Bardot. Oh, for sure. Um, and some on my list, which I won't mention yet, but you're right. It yeah, was, it was even the year. Yeah. Nope. Like, it's kind of about movie making. It is, yeah. Um, It's about spectacle more. They even like, have, like, the Mybridge horse. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. So I definitely saw that, that theme running through. I think you nailed uh, it. This I think, year's movies. Yeah. Uh, films about films and films like the, 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 the vanity very, project. Like, personal. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Saw a lot of like autobiographical totally, stories. Totally, totally. Yeah. I know what you're thinking about. Well, a couple of my, so like yeah. Apollo, it, Apollo 10 yeah. and a half is there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Bardo. Which is good because it's good because we always like, you know, there's always this fear that like, oh, what's the future of movies? But I actually think that it's hopeful that all these, like, here's the thing. Everyone is saying like indulgent, indulgent, indulgent as like such a bad thing. Like, oh, that's so like narcissistic and vain and self-indulgent. I actually don't think it's that bad of a thing. Like to a degree, I feel like if we lose that, I don't, I, there needs to be a balance for sure. But I feel like if we lose that, then we lose like auteurs. It's true. Like, I, no, you're right. And I think I'm more prone to being annoyed at it than you are. And I'm not quite sure why I let some people get away with it. Like with Bardo and then other, like I, you know, big spoiler here. I don't really like the Fablemans and Spielberg is like the reason I even love movies in the first place. So like, I don't, I don't know why I let Inurito through the gate, but I didn't let Spielberg through the gate. Well, like, I think it's because Bardo is so imaginative and like full of like just cinematic moments. Like, Spielberg is, I mean, Fablemans didn't really give us anything that new where I feel like Bardo is so wacky and so cool and so kind of grand. And I mean, yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mm. <laughs> do you want to start? Do you want to start with your number 10? Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay. So I know when we said we were going to do this, 
we we decided that it was going to be movies with theatrical releases in 2022. Well, not necessarily theatrical, US. but like released in the U.S. in so, 2022. I get it. <laughs> but I also felt really wrong doing that because I was thinking about like, for example, like David Ehrlich's like top uh, 25 countdown. Of course, he gets to see everything because he's like the number one film critic in the world. But like, is he really in the U.S.? Really? I think he's the most like, I mean, I don't know. I was just thinking about like his video montages and they're all so like of the year that I felt really like weird talking about movies that came out in 2021. So for my top 10, for my 10 spot, what I did was combine two movies that did have US releases. Okay, well, let me just say, I'm so glad that you combined two films because one of my spots, I also combined two films and Good. I felt like you were going to get mad at me. So I'm glad No, that why would I get mad at you? <laughs> I'm the person who can't decide favorites. Yeah. Um, so what I did, that's why they're at number 10. I didn't necessarily like these less than if I was to actually order them in the list, they would probably be higher, honestly. But for reasons that I just explained, they are tied for 10 because they did come out in 2021. Like they're two year old movies at this point, which is why I feel weird, like including them on the list. But it's Petit Mama by Celine Siama and Vortex by Gaspar Noé. Cool, cool. Um, And they're tied. Like it's. Anyway, um, I know you love Vortex, yes. and I know it's probably on your list somewhere, like very high. Um, <laughs> Why do you think that? Because I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it's just devastating and ambitious. Like you don't. It's so easy to be devastating. You don't need to do a split screen, but like he did anyway, and it's like I think that's super ambitious. Yeah, I know you're gonna talk about it a lot more. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then the quote at the start just really, I still think about it all the time. Uh, For those whose brains die before their hearts. It's so, so, so tragic. Um, And then, yeah, Petit Mama, just literally, like, how are you this cute? I just don't understand. (laughs) Um, I'm just obsessed with the fact that uh, Celine Siama made this after Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I love the way, like, she takes the experiences of children so seriously Um, Her film Tomboy does it really well, too. But it's like it's just so natural and tender and fun at the same time. But it's like she's treating it with such gravity. Um, Yeah. And like I love how her and Joanna Hogg, like their follow ups to these grand acclaimed movies are these small little pieces about like mother daughter relationships. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting, like a cute little trend. Yeah. Um, But that's my number 10. Cool. I like it. I'm into it um my i guess my argument for doing the films because for example vortex did come out in 2021 in france i think and it's the kind of thing where if you're going by the year it's released then i could never include it on my list because i will have not seen it until 2022 and so that's just i know other critics do that sometimes when they'll be like the movie has to have been released like Mark Kermode, the great British film critic, he does movies released in the UK in that year. Oh, he does. Because okay. otherwise, it's just hard to like. Some movies will just never get on your list because they will have, they'll have come out and you won't have had a chance. No, to, totally, to totally. See it. But I think I was just thinking about like, like I said, like that whole video countdown and also like the Oscars. And, right. I don't know. Yeah. No, makes sense. What's your number ten? My number ten is a documentary. I'm not a huge documentary fan, just because uh, these days I think in the age of like the Netflix documentary or docu series, it's just informational, and mm-hmm. I think we've kind of lost the art of the documentary, Definitely. like the Errol Morris documentary and stuff. So mine is number my number ten is a movie called Fire of Love by Sarah Dosa. This is actually a National Geographic documentary, and it's on Disney Plus. And it's essentially about, not essentially, it is, it's about a husband and wife volcanologist team. Whoa. So they were like the only husband and wife team of volcanologists and it follows them. So they shot all this great home footage. Like they were, they started like in the sixties and then I'm not giving anything away by saying this, but like they, cause the film opens with like, they died in the early nineties in an eruption oh, in, in like no. Japan. So they died together doing what they love. But the film takes all their home movies and and presents them. And it's done in this really cool way. And I absolutely loved it. It's surprisingly not a downer, even though, you know, obviously they don't make it. Yeah. Um, it's really life affirming and 
beautifully done. It has great music. And they just shot all this beautiful, like, 16 millimeter film. I think it's 16 millimeter, maybe some Super 8, of just these, like, lava flows. And it's stunning. That's so cool. It's stunning. And there's all this on camera, like, footage of them, like, doing interviews and talking. So it's not just, like, their footage. Like, you get their voices and... Mm -hmm. It's just super, super cool. I really, really dug it. Two people that just are not content to stay at home. They like always have to be out and they have to be seeking like a volcano. And hearing their like their draw to volcanoes. Like the first time I saw a volcano erupt, I knew that there was like nothing else for me in life. And I was Whoa. like, Yeah. It's like it's very, very cool. That's wow. my number 10. Yeah. That sounds so cool. What's it called? It's called Fire of Love. Wow. Yeah. You're number nine. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> S- kind of spitballing off of my whole comparison with Joanna Hogg, my number nine is The Eternal Daughter. Oh boy, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it as well, but I am so biased. I am so biased. <laughs> I'm all in on the Souvenir series, and I didn't know that this was like a direct sequel. I really had no idea. I thought like I knew it was like thematically really similar and like obviously Tilda Swinton is playing both roles, but I did not know that she was straight up playing Julie, yeah. who was played by her daughter, Honor Swinton Byrne, in the Souvenir series. Yeah. So imagine your mom playing you. One, imagine that. Two, imagine it's Tilda Swinton who does an incredible job. Like it's in the inflections and the way she's like so like kind of soft spoken and shy like she's imitating her daughter and it's so freaking cool really really cool and then obviously she's playing the character she created in the souvenir series um of the mother and it's really heartbreaking and really sad yeah and i don't know it's really fearful for women uh any woman who wants to have children and be a director to hear something like oh her films take up her time anyway like she didn't have kids like each one took up as much time and that was really scary obviously i'm all in like i can't help it i'm just (laughs) all in on this i'm so invested in this series Uh, i love the kind of like gothic britishness of it all so good i know you love that (laughs) i love how like the ghosts are never explained it's just a random face in the window and random noises and i just yeah obviously loved it nice (laughs) that's number nine cool uh my number nine is an animated film called the house Hmm. so this was i think net so netflix acquired the u.s rights which is funny because it doesn't have netflix written over it at all but it's essentially it's a stop motion animation film and it's three segments all that kind of have to do with like this house and the filmmakers are uh, Paloma Baeza, uh, Nikki Landroth von Barr, Emma DeSwaif, and Mark James Rolls. So two of them. So there's a fantastic movie that came out a couple years ago called This Magnificent Cake. And it's by two of the they, – they do the first segment in this film, The House. And I was comp- I was so mesmerized by that movie. It's this very unique. They have a very unique um, animation style and just like character model style, and it's super cool. So it's just it's literally it's pretty dark. You know, it's for adults, but it's three vignettes about this house. The first one involves these kids, this family that moves into a house like they're humans, and then the other two segments are ath- anthropomorphic animals. So the second Ooh. segment is about this rat that's like selling a house. He's like fixing it up to sell it. And the third segment is about a cat who, like, the hotel's flooding and all the tenants... It's like, no, sorry. It's an apartment building. All the tenants have moved out and it's flooding. And there's only a couple tenants left. And she's, like, trying to fix up the the apartment building as everyone else is, like, piecing out. Like, hey, like, it's flooded. Like, we're leaving. Like, there's not even just the hotel is flooded. Like, there's the hotel... Sorry, the apartment building is in this, like, flooded wasteland. So she's like hanging on to this apartment wow. building, and, and yeah, she's a rat. She's a she's a cat. Oh, she's the a second cat. one is a rat though. And but yeah, I really dug this. What's it called? It's called The House. The House. It's on Netflix. Do you think it'll be nominated for Best Animated Feature? Honestly, maybe because it's a Netflix because Netflix acquired it for the U.S. It's possible they might push, but of course, it's like not going to get. It. Was the cake <laughs> movie? I think the cake was this magnificent cake was nominated for best animated short. I think. Oh, 
okay. And that might have been where I heard about that. I was like, oh, that looks cool. And then I like sought it out and I was like, Mm -hmm. oh shit. Like it didn't win, I don't think, but uh, yeah, great film. Loved it. Your number eight? My number eight is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Wow. Yeah. Are you surprised? No. Uh, I know you really dug it. I really dug it. I say this on the podcast all the time, how much the movies I saw as a kid uh, affected me, especially since I was only allowed to watch kids movies. And I'm just so happy this exists. Um, yeah. Like we need more movies like this. We need movies for kids that are interesting. Don't treat them like they're dumb. Allows them to be devastated, scared, joyful, like all in the same movie. We need that. And Guillermo del Toro is an amazing artist and it's so beautifully crafted. It's filmed to the brim. Like you can just see how invested he was and like the love that went into it. It's really palpable. And I really, really dug it. And um, I didn't know Ewan McGregor was in it. I literally watched it. on. I think I watched it on Christmas Eve. I didn't know he was in it. Wait, you couldn't tell? No, no, no. Like before oh, the movie before started, started. But of course, he's the first voice and I shrieked. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> I was so excited. And that just made me so happy. And what's better than a cricket named Sebastian drinking tea and writing his memoirs in his little tree apartment? Yeah, it's basically Christian me. from <laughs> Moulin Rouge from Moulin writing Rouge. his memoirs. Exactly. Exactly. Um. And yeah, being Guillermo, like I just, Guillermo, like he's my friend, being Guillermo del Toro, um, you know, I just love that he, like, this fairy tale exists in a real time and place. And I love that about it. I love that it's actually Italy defined. They're speaking Italian. There's a church. There's a priest. It makes it so real. Um, There's war. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I really, really liked it. And I think that. I don't I never liked Pinocchio that much and this I think is my favorite Pinocchio. Like I'm really not a big Pinocchio person. It always scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I was scared this one was going to be too scary for kids, but I don't think it's too scary for kids. I think it's just the perfect amount of scary and um smart and I really really liked it. And yeah, like this whole motif about like Jesus and his role as a son being compared to like Pinocchio whose dad actually made him, created him like what who does that like i thought it was incredible i thought it was really really cool and i do really like the music i think my thing is like alexandra desplat is not a composer of songs and i thought a lot of the songs just kind of sounded like his scores but just like not quite as i don't know for me the music some didn't songs work. are better no some songs are better than others mm-hmm. i will admit but overall yeah yeah, it's one I really you wanted to like. Me. I don't dislike it, but I was. I think I love the Disney Pinocchio. Do like, you? It's one of my favorite Disney movies. Really? Yeah. So it might have ha- that might have been a part totally. of like it deviates so much from like the story, but uh, <sighs> in a good way. Yeah, actually, I've never read like the original <laughs> fairy tale or book, so maybe this is closer. I don't know. Me neither. Yeah. Your number eight, sir. Okay, this my number eight really shocked me. Okay, <laughs> but I had I gotta I gotta you know give it up for oh this God, movie. Tell me, it's Thirteen Lives. This is a Ron Howard film. You saw it? Yes. When? I actually saw it last night. You're only saying this because PTA said it was his favorite movie. No. Okay. So let me tell you. So I was looking through Amazon Prime, and I saw it was on there. I was like, oh yeah, and I saw it like Colin Farrell and Viggo Mortensen. I was like, oh. Yeah, and I, Colin Farrell's in it. Yeah, Colin Farrell's in it. He's one of the main characters. Oh. It's like it's like the two of them. So I remember when that happened in like 2018. That was not that long ago. Yeah, it was the st- team, a soccer team, right? Yeah. Stuck. Yeah. So I want to say, you know, again, that I so last night I watched two films in preparation for this episode. I watched After Sun and then I watched Thirteen Lies. And if you had told me beforehand that After Sun was not going to be on my list and that the Ron Howard movie would, I would not have believed you. You didn't like After Sun. <laughs> it's not that I didn't like After Sun, but I found it relatively indulgent. And, uh, you know, I'm all for things being vague and subtle, but like it was to the point of like frustration. And I think, <laughs> not to go off too off the rails, because I'm sure this film's going to be on your list. But like when you have shot after shot of like 
oh, this is their reflection in the TV. Oh, here's their shadow. And I started to get mad because it's like, just show their faces. And I get that it's like this half remembered thing, but like, I, I didn't dislike the movie. I thought it was a very strong like debut, but it did not like blow me away or like, wow. I found it uh, relatively frustrating. And it's funny, I watched that first and then I watched this Ron Howard film. You're fired. And it's, it. <laughs> this made it on my list. So wow. yeah, 13 Lives is the story of uh, back in 2018, this like th- this team of soccer kids, they were like young, went into this cave. And while they were back in the cave, it started raining and the, cr- the cave flooded. And it was like this 18 day rescue mission. And so the film chronicles in incredible detail the rescue of these kids. Now, let me say, you know, I grew up on a couple, you know, backdraft and like Apollo 13 and stuff, but I'm no like Ron Howard fan. Like I think as far as those kinds of directors go, like he's relatively boring, like and I don't think he's done anything really worthwhile um, in like 20 years. Well, The Grinch, but that was more than 20 years ago. That was like 2003 or something. But it's a masterpiece. Yeah. So <laughs> That's so, I always forget that he did that. The Grinch is a masterpiece. So I'm here to say this is the best Ron Howard movie I've ever seen. So Can't like be better than The Grinch. This is a two and a half hour film that details like I think this is one of the best like based on a true story type movies I've ever seen. Two and a half hours and you're riveted to your seat the entire time. Now you don't get a lot of great character stuff in here. You don't get to know these people like on a personal level. But it almost like doesn't matter. It's like such a testament to the human spirit for like, because all these volunteers from all all over the world flew in to try to save these kids. And it is riveting filmmaking. It really is. And the way that he makes the film in terms of like, because they're so far back in the cave and he does these cool things. Like he tells you what chamber they're in and like how far it took them to get to that chamber. And he shows you a map of the cave. Like he overlays it over the screen really really riveting stuff like i couldn't help but be moved by it by i was just riveted the entire time this is i see your face right now i swear this is a huge shock to me and then yeah i did look it up afterwards and i saw that pta said it was his favorite film from last year too and then i felt validated i was like oh okay like because i felt crazy i was like i love this ron howard why would movie you decide that... to watch a ron howard movie because you, you know why if you don't like him and because you know about the pta thing so i used to be I used to cave like that was one of my big pastimes. I used to cave? go. And, yeah, I used to be like a caver. Explain yourself. A spelunker. What's that? It's caving. What is caving? Just going in a cave? Yeah, but going in like not like a hole in the ground and there's like a plaque that says what cave it is and you just go through the hole. Why would you do that? I've there's picked, I've literally squeezed through spaces that like I could barely fit through. Like oh my God. I used to do that. I'm not into it anymore, but like I used to do it. So there, that's one reason I watch it. Another reason I remember when that happened a few years ago and I'm just like naturally dr- like, <laughs> you know, that movie Everest from a few years ago. I just love like um, survival, mo- survival movies about like nature like I love I hate them storms or like so, no I like oh what did yeah. you like that one with Robert Redford where he's on a ship yeah that was pretty good all is lost or something yeah yeah it's sad because I guess MGM had this big like uh award season release planned in November but then Amazon got it and I think Amazon just dumped it out in summer on streaming or something or like I think it was theatrical also but like I don't know that that it, many it was, people saw yeah. it yeah and again, not to be mean, I you know, I like some of his movies, but Ron Howard's like not on my radar at all of like, oh, what's his next film? And yes, this was incredible. Now I understand there's a documentary from a year or two ago called The Rescue, mm-hmm. and it details the same story. Now, if I had seen that first, would I, would I have liked this as much? I don't know. <laughs> but the, I have not seen that documentary. I went into Ron Howard's movie this being my first again i didn't know so many of the details that happened in the story but do they all survive do you want me to tell you Mm, (laughs) yeah i don't think all the kids survive oh really is that true yeah absolutely worth a watch like it is really back to like nuts and bolts style filmmaking of like it reminded me of a 90s movie like in a great great way highly recommend 13 lives and i can't believe i just put it on my top 10 but it's that good that's crazy that's really really crazy. <laughs> yeah. Happy for you. Yeah. How about you? What's your number seven? 
My number seven is a little story about a little donkey named Eo. Oh, I feel bad. <laughs> I should have seen this. It's, well, it's okay. It's directed by Jerzy Skolimowski. He's a Polish director. Um, I've come to the conclusion. I don't think I've ever seen a Polish movie I don't like. I'm really into like Polish filmmaking. I thought you were going to say, I've never seen a Polish movie. That's no. What you were going to say. And I was like, you have. I've ne- No, I don't think I've ever seen one I didn't like. I'm not kidding. Um, you know, this year gave us reworkings of Oh Hazard Balthazar and Eight and a Half. And I really liked both of them. Like they both worked for me so well. Um, what I like about this, though, is that where Balthazar, like <clears throat> most of the experiences he has are bad. Um, in here, EO is with people who love him or at least like take care of him a lot more than not. Um, but the other factors that are like predatory yes of course it's like human violence and it is a movie about animal rights but it's also about environmental rights and like um yeah so it's like i don't know it was interesting it wasn't the same it wasn't like just as clear cut like it's balthazar and it's really interesting because it opens with him with like the girl of his life like his uh counterpart to um marie and oh is balthazar She's like, he's in a circus. She's the circus performer. Like, he's in her act. But they love each other. Like, she's his, like, mom, essentially. Um, But she's juxtaposed, like, they juxtapose that with, like, animal rights activists. And they're the reason EO is taken away from her. But it's, like, animal rights activists. So it's, like, really, I don't know. I thought it was really, really cool to do that. Um, And so much more interesting than just opening it with him being, like, tortured. Like, you know, like, it's actually the people trying to help him who, like, took him away. It's all just about the way that humans think that we have, like, um, like, we are the masters of animals' fates. Like, that's what the whole movie's about. Uh, And it's so interesting and really sweet. And really, like, the score, the score is by a composer called Pavel Mikatin. It's probably my favorite score of the year. It's wow. really beautiful. And it's set against these very impressionistic landscapes. The cinematography is gorgeous. And he, but like, they're very impressionistic. Like there's like bright red and lasers and like the music swells. And it's, it's really, really cool. I think you'll like it more than Balthazar. Um, and of course there's a totally unexplained scene with Isabel Huppert. Like, oh really? Totally random. She's in it for like, less than 10 minutes and it's not explained like what the fuck is going on like it's like her and her stepson you kind of get like little like you get a little hint but like no questions are answered and like it's just another way that like balthazar was like brought there because the stepson like found him and it's i don't know it's it's really balthazar i called him balthazar (laughs) eo um does the um, eo stand for something no i think it's just like captain the sound no like the sound donkeys me oh right right um <laughs> yeah and it really plays with something i love because i love donkeys donkeys wait you do love donkeys yeah oh maybe you said that in Balthazar. i love donkeys i i wish i had a donkey like the donkey as the horse's ugly cousin <laughs> like, i love that and it's so sad uh amazing sound design like if you i know you love sound design the sound design in this is incredible super great asmr moments the ending is told completely with sound thankfully because if it was told with sight it would be really freaking heartbreaking oh Um, god but yeah (laughs) that's eo it sounds great honestly i think you'd really like it i think you should see it in theaters it's playing at the lemley or when we record this it is i know that made a lot of people's and publications like top cup like three films or something so that's when i feel bad about not having seen yeah it was really good um, cool. Well, yeah, I will check it out. What's your seven? My seven. Speaking of uh, disaster stories, <laughs> this is a shipwrecked tale. This is Ruben Oslin's yes! Triangle of Sadness. So this was, I actually saw this film. I want, it was the day before I got married. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because you have this day, you know, we got married on a Sunday and Molly was like, oh, well, you and your groomsmen like have Saturday. Like, what activity do you want to do? I was like, activity. <laughs> so like, I was like trying to come up with things for us to do. And my groomsmen were, you know, like I have a, a cinephile or two in there. And then I have friends who are like not cinephiles. And so I was like trying to pick something that would be appropriate for everybody. 
and I did, I picked Triangle of Sadness and we went to go see it. And actually everyone like really loved it. Like my cinephile friends loved it. My friend who just likes like Back to the Future and Jaws like liked it. Um, it's, I think it's really great. I think it's really great. I too. think it was hyped maybe a little too much. I remember uh, right when it came out, Sean Baker, who we both love, was like, this is my favorite movie of like this, the century so far. And I was like, holy shit, is it that good? Because I really liked Ruben Oslin's last film, The Square, a lot, a lot. Um, and actually, I think I like The Square a little more than Triangle of Sadness, but Triangle of Sadness is still great. Um, so no, it's not my favorite film from the last 20 years. It's even, you know, it's number seven on my list, but I really liked it. It is very cutting and hilarious. Yes. And there's like a certain, I gravitate towards films that devolve to a certain like primal state. Mm -hmm. And this film absolutely does Mm -hmm. that. It's like a controlled John Waters film for like a 30 minute stretch or something. And what I loved so much about the film is it keeps changing. Again, not to give anything away if you haven't seen it, but it starts as one thing. It becomes something else, becomes something else. The the characters change in terms of like who you're following and like great film, great mm-hmm. film, hilarious. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, the buzz about it has been big, but for a good reason. Yes. And yeah. Great film. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny because we don't know like what we're gonna say i mean you just said after sun's not on your list yeah which makes me really really (laughs) really 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 i knew that was gonna upset you that's really sad (laughs) i'm sorry listen i just like i wasn't just i wasn't that into you didn't cry no 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 no. i was sobbing there's just there's things well i know it's on your list we'll we'll talk about it when when you say (laughs) anyway what is your number six bardo Bardo. Okay. Okay. Um, so I didn't know this, but I just want to share the film's title is actually a Buddhist term meaning transitional phase, like between life and death, right. which is appropriate. I like how like it's hinted that I, I mean, you pretty much know, like from the first scene where he's on the bus, I think you know what's coming and I think you know what happened or the train. At least I did. I was like, oh, for sure. The LA like Metro his. too. Shout out. Yeah. I was very, has um, a movie ever been shot on the LA Metro before? I thought about that. I <laughs> literally thought about that. Um, it's grand. It's epic. Beautiful cinematography by Darius Honji. He's, um, a, he's a legend. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. Incredible. It's, I love, you know, again, I'm going back to this whole like, um self-indulgent thing like this thing we've been talking about i think it's like shamelessly autobiographical self-reflexive but fun and i loved it like i don't know i think that in a few years people will return to this and realize what a feat it is because i feel like people don't realize it now i think it might take a little time especially as injury 2 gets older um i think people are gonna return to it like like we talk about all the time we talk about movies that like weren't really critically acclaimed when they came out but then years down the line like they really i mean bardo has been acclaimed by like some people but i feel like most people know um but i think that in a few years it will make a comeback um yeah like i said directors constantly being called self-indulgent nowadays but i still love eight and a half type movies and there's a direct reference at the start there's a direct reference at the end but they're so i i don't think they're too like they're direct, but I don't think they're too direct. I still think they're super unique. Both of those references, um, super cool and innovative. Um, and it touches on things I care about, like transplants in a diaspora, the way that artists exploit that and like the morality of that, um, the way they exploit everything, everything about their lives and their tragedies and the expectations and images we have about ourselves and when you have imposter syndrome, but you don't really have imposter syndrome, you're kind of just using it as a cover that like, maybe you just don't like yourself that much. And I don't know. And and yeah, just told in this really kooky cinematic way, using everything in the toolbox. Playfully surreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's so playfully surreal. Um, Like eight and a half, but yeah, I wish I could have seen this in a theater. I really do. I watched it at home. Um, I think it's one for, the books so to speak (laughs) you know if if it i hate to say this but if it was trimmed slightly i it would probably be on my 10 i think there's like the scene where he talks like cortez was like like oh i was like this is too far like this is too much don't you just love how the scenes kind of like i don't know i I really liked it and i really liked the way that people do this all the time the way that they shoot movies being shot 
And I think that the way that this did that was so cool. Yeah, I think it's just the the idea of the scene is it was slightly indulgent. Again, the the movie you have to be on board with the you know the indulgence. But, the uh, indulgence, indulgence. I never want to hear that word again. I'm so sick of hearing that. Yeah, word. but it's it's a real thing. I'm so sick of it. Actually, I just remembered because at one time on the show, I stated what my eight and a half was, and then every time I've been, we've like brought it up, and I keep forgetting what it, I said. It's all that jazz. All that jazz is my eight and a half. Huh? Yes, all that jazz is an amazing eight and a half. Yeah, that's my eight and a half. That's the Greg version. Yes. <laughs> it's incredible. I also said Irma Vep one time. Was oh, yeah, yeah. That's close. Yeah. I yeah, love yeah, Irma yeah. Vep. It's great. I love eight and a half. I know you don't love eight and a half that much. I like Irma Vep and All That Jazz more, especially All That Jazz, which is a, on a short list of my favorite movies. Yeah. 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 Cool. No, I, I really dug That's it. I was surprised show. how much I liked Bardo. I was surprised too yeah. because you I've been hearing a lot of bad things about it and I was like, what? Well, because who needs another film about like a middle aged male filmmaker and like, but, but it, it didn't go it didn't, to those yeah, places with like all the women. So many things. Because yeah. see, eight and a half is about like all the women. And this is not really. No, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, it's about like it's more about this kind of like dual citizenship, which I find really interesting. Yeah, I and, loved all that in this movie. Yeah. Him grappling with his feelings totally. for Mexico and the U.S. and totally. Yeah, yeah, really, uh, some really profound stuff in there. Yeah. What's your number six? My number six? Yeah, your number six. My number six. Okay. Initially, this was actually slightly higher, and it got bumped down after I saw so many great films. This is the film with Tom Cruise, Top Gun Maverick. Wow. (laughs) Joseph Kaczynski-directed film. Now, I have to preface by saying Top Gun, the first one, means nothing to me. I think it's like our parents' generation. That's their movie. And I didn't grow up with Top Gun. And surprisingly, like when I finally saw it a couple years ago for the first time, I wasn't that into it. Yeah. And that seems to be a common theme. A lot of people totally. my our age, I talk to like, yeah, I don't care about Top I Gun. I really don't care about it that much. I'm sorry. I don't want to cut you off. Oh, no, no. Have you ever seen An Officer and a Gentleman with Richard Gere? You know what? I've Weaver. never seen it. It's the better version of Top Gun. Oh, okay. Yeah. You should watch it. I yeah. mean, there's no like play. There's, I mean, there's some playing scenes, but it's more about, it's more of a character study. Right. Well, see, I love Top Gun for the action. So, okay, this is, yes, it's it's U.S. military propaganda. Both films are, <laughs> <laughs> literally. But, I mean, come on. Like, I'm not going to make a secret that I'm a big Tom Cruise fan. Like, obviously, Scientology is fucking weird, and there's some shady shit in his past. But the man is an entertainer, and good <laughs> Lord. Like, there are so few people who push it to that level. Yeah. And again, Tom Cruise is involved at a producer level with all of his stuff. And he, you know, he's responsible for a lot of the creative choices made. And I've always been a Tom Cruise fan. I love him in the Mission Impossible movies. I love him in the dramatic turns he's made. I love him in Magnolia. I love him in Eyes Wide Shut. And so, like, I'm always rooting for him on Mm -hmm. screen just because Mm -hmm. he's such a movie star. Like, he's so likable as, like, on screen. Totally. Maybe not so much in real life, but, like, he just goes for it. Yeah. And he puts himself out there, and he wouldn't expect anyone to do something that he's not willing to do himself. And this film is, like, the ultimate testament to that. And not only do I think this movie is way better than the, the first Top Gun, but, like, I think this is one of the best big hollywood action movies we had in at least f- like five years like yeah, what's it competing with fast and furious <laughs> well t- in all fairness i haven't seen those movies but like it, you know it's competing with like superhero stuff and it's competing with you know and i think we talked about this when we first saw it like six months ago but what's so cool about this movie is it's a simple story the world the fate of the world is not at stake mm-hmm. and you get to spend time with the characters, not to say they're like fleshed out. Like, yeah, the dialogue is cheesy. Like it's, it's such a, it's a throwback movie, Mm -hmm. but what's so cool about it is they're in real jets pulling real G forces. And that shows on camera. It's not like a superhero movie where everyone charges, charges at each other. And it's just like CG flying everywhere that you can't even make out what's happening. Like this stuff's happening in front of you on camera. And also the action is simple. It's clean. You always, you're able to keep track of people in like their jets. And this, there's one mission, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole movie, they're training for this mission. And the Mm -hmm. the great part of the movie is 
you are so aware of what they're supposed to supposed to accomplish on this mission that when they do it every second is tense because you know exactly what they're supposed to do and if someone makes one mistake you know because you've watched them train for it right i love the film i love it was fun it was a great time at the movies and i wish that you know more modern action movies would take note that like bigger is not always better and like we can tell when C, you know, CG is being used. Obviously, you have to use it sometimes, but like it, you know, it just there's something to be said for doing it in camera, cleanly, simply. That's totally. it. Top Gun Maverick. Is it all real? Like when he really goes up into the stratosphere, is he actually going up into the stratosphere? I don't know. <laughs> I, like I don't think they're in those jets. It like obviously professionals are flying the jets when you see the jets like going up and stuff. But they're like in a simulator or or a real jet, and like when you see their like That's cheeks what going I'm back, yeah, maybe they're like in another seat. I'm not quite sure how it was made, but it just everything looks real. Yeah, and yeah it does. I love it. I liked it. <laughs> I know it's your number one, Jackie. Definitely. <laughs> what is your number five? My number five is Decision to Leave by Park Chen Wook. You would really, I mean, you know what? I'm never going to say you would like anything. Well, in all fairness, I have no idea. (laughs) I don't know how to gauge you anymore. I really don't. I've never seen one of his films that I didn't like. Okay. More movies need to be like Decision to Leave. I have a theory that if we had three to five Decision to Leaves a year, cinema would be saved. Like, we wouldn't have to worry. (laughs) We would not have to worry because. It's a movie anyone can enjoy. It's so compelling, but it's so beautifully made. And we need more. Like, this is what we need. This type of movie. This type of, like, um, like romantic, noir, mystery, crime. Like, this is what I think is the end. I saw it was being advertised as, like, the next Parasite. It's not Parasite by any means. <laughs> Who said that? The trailer, I think. And I think it's they like they use a blurb from a critic. I think they just mean in the sense that it has like a wide it's appeal. Korean, and it's like Korean. Like what? Yeah. No, no. It's nothing like it. It's so, I mean, so is Parasite, but so tight, so calculated, and so full of emotion. Like it's, it's like a slick noir with a big heart. That's the best way hey, to describe it. I love it. that. Like, I'm it's, all in. It's and the opening is like very Hitchcock. Like the credits are like Hitchcock. Cool. It's Saw really, bass. really very cool. cool. Um and yeah, the cast is amazing. Tong Wei, uh, she's incredible. Um, the guy is amazing too. Park Hai Yu, he's I mean, they're both so, so good. I, I can't really talk about it without giving much away, but I just think that it's so precise and so unique, but also like I think that it is for the masses, but for a smart, it, it's not, it's not doubting that people want good movies. Like, is it for the multiplex crowd? Anything. It can be. That's right. the point. Like, I think that's, that's what they I meant by the parasite. Can, Cause that was like, yes, that played well in multiplexes. That's how I feel about this movie, especially because people love true crime stuff. They love detective stuff. I don't yeah. Know. Cool. Yeah, I need to see you that. See it. I'm gonna see that like in the next couple days. You would really like it. I oh, actually, I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stop saying that. Uh, my number five. This is. I think this is our first crossover. This is Eternal Daughter. <laughs> is this our first crossover? Uh, so far. Yeah, I'm it's sad. our first crossover. <laughs> it's happening to us. No, it just because you and I have slightly different. There's like a lot of overlap, but then there's like you know. We kind of lean in slightly different directions. I don't know if there's a lot of overlap. Well, we'll see. I mean, I had Bardo in my honorable mentions. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, this is Eternal Daughter, the Joanna Hogg movie. You turned me on to Joanna Hogg. I had heard of the souvenir and I got it mixed up with that movie, um, The Invitation or something, <laughs> which is no- has nothing yeah. to do with it. But I was like, <laughs> oh, there's a movie called The Souvenir and The Invitation. I don't know. And I just like threw my hands up. And then you're like, The you Invitation know- of Life? <laughs> no it's just the invitation um but yeah you told me to go see souvenir like right now and of course they're both great they're... i did one thing right yay yeah. <laughs> you did so much right <laughs> love the souvenir and when i found out that joanna hogg her next project was this gothic kind of ghost story i was like i am 150 percent in so you. i put all my chips in <laughs> <laughs> and yes, this was great. This did not let me down. Yeah. Tilda Swinton plays two characters, the mother and the daughter. And 
she's like 95 percent of the movie isn't it like her and there's the guy oh and then there's there's like three there's people the in this movie front desk lady yeah and then the other guy who's like the other guy who's like the caretaker yeah it's three people it's like I three think. actors there's like the cousin that comes for a few oh, seconds yeah. they're in one scene um yeah yeah it's this crazy. is so it's, good yeah it's so tense and that that rude front desk lady just makes me <laughs> so mad and it's so subtle the way she's being rude like it's not really subtle but it is it's not like people try to write rude um employees in a very predictable way and i just love the way that this girl was written I think yeah it was so natural yeah and, yeah no and she's so Julie's good. like so sweet and yeah I, I don't know. She just pulls because there's something when the film starts, like the first half of the film is kind of Tilda Swinton arriving at this hotel with her mom. And tr- she's like writing. She's a film director. right? Because she she's is like, literally jo- the she's character. She's Julie, who is Joanna Hogg. Exactly. Again, a director making a movie that's basically right. a stand in for them. Right. But this one's like a genre thing. Right. And so for the first half, it's essentially this like ghost story. But then as the film goes on, it's about so much more. It's about sort of family and like yeah, roots and where you come and... from and memories and it's just oh my god yeah. and i could just die the the gothic atmosphere in this film just kill me and just lay me out and like <laughs> that it's she does it so well yeah there's just a quiet eeriness to everything so eerie because I'm writing, you know, I'm writing a ghost uh, story, and I've long been obsessed with the ghost story. And if you look over there, you'll see a, um, a stack of Victorian era ghost story books, um, not from the Victorian era, but Victorian era ghost stories. There's a couple because I'm like I'm trying to oh, immerse myself. Tales of the supernatural, yeah, Nordic tales, well, and housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. <laughs> yeah. You have a nice bookcase, <laughs> but yeah, no. So you know, this is like so many people get the ghost stuff wrong. I loved it. And, and like then, you said, I want to watch it again right now, you know. I would watch it. Yeah. What's your number 4? It is Martin McDonough's The Banshees of Inisherin. Oh, interesting. Is that your number 4? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ireland. Um I love the storytelling, I love the poetry, I love the poetic landscape. I'm just all in for ireland um i went there in like 2017 one of the best trips i've ever taken the music everything and i love how this is just like folklore but making an existential crisis and it's just so good like it's so entertaining the performances are incredible the writing's incredible there's it's i don't think it's possible to not like this movie i mean it is of course but i just feel like it's so easy to sit Put this movie on. You're swept away. It's a really compelling story. Really funny. Has a lot of heart. But then it's also really tragic. Um, yeah, and it's just such a simple story. But the stakes are so high. But only until you realize, like, oh, they're just on an island. Like, they're just this little part. Like, the stakes aren't really that high. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. But they are because Colm is so bored that he's gone crazy. They have nothing else to do. He's gone yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's just, it's so, so good. He's so wanting for interesting things to happen to him (laughs) that he literally goes mad. And it's, I don't know. But then something about him is so relatable. Like, how many times have you wished you could just, like, cut out someone that, like, you have nothing in common with anymore or, like, you think is taking up your time? Of course, everyone can relate to, like, cutting off relationships. I mean, not everyone, but a lot of people, I think, can relate to, like, cutting off relationships. Um in sacrifice of like your legacy and i just feel like it's just such a fun way to like play this theme out and wicked and of course they're like throwing a witch in there and i don't know yeah i love it i love folklore i love folky things um yeah nice yeah uh no comment (laughs) (laughs) um Barry Cogan is getting a lot of praise oh, for yeah. his turn as Dominic. He's great in everything. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's so, so good. Oh, and then I remember last episode we talked about contemporary composers and how you asked like us to name some. Carter Burwell, I totally forgot to mention. Yeah. I love Carter Burwell. No, yeah. He, when he's good, he's really good. Not every... T- sometimes I'll see a movie, I'll be like, oh, this score is like fine. And then I'll see his name at the end. I'm like, oh. But like, yeah, when he's on, he's like great. 
obviously he's like the mostly known as the Cohen Brothers uh composer. But I love does him. does lots of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I forgot he did this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that it is a great movie and it, I think again, we need more movies like this. I agree. What is your number four? My number four is Brett Morgan's, I guess it's not really a documentary, but it's Moon Age Daydream, mm-hmm. the David Bowie film. Of course, I'm biased. David Bowie is a god. And this, we finally got like a fitting cinematic tribute to him. Mm-hmm. And again, it's like this movie has had some, um, I've heard p- people complain about it and say that, it, you don't get to know Bowie the man in the mm-hmm. film. And I think that's com- so not the point. The point is, as a person who was concerned, who was constantly changing himself and reinventing himself and coming into new characters himself, the film works with the mythology. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's all about the mythology of Bowie. So mm-hmm. if you come into this looking for Bowie the man and, like, videos of him playing with his kids or something, that's not what you're going to get here. You're going to instead get this psychedelic fantasia of sight and sound and just he just he does such a great job i did have the pleasure of yeah i saw this at the chinese theater opening night on imax and i was at a, across the street at this like this sounds so bougie in la which is it's not me at all but i was at this like poolside i know bar, and you saw <laughs> and i saw the director and like we struck up a conversation so i got to talk to him a little bit he complimented i was wearing a made me fall the earth t-shirt um but yeah it's this um it's it's just incredible and of course there's some concert footage in, in here that's never been seen before and the way that he just kind of weaves it's almost like a stream of consciousness like the way that it unfolds this fantasia it it's incredible and if you're a bowie fan this is a must have if you haven't seen this yet and you're a bowie fan what are you doing this is v film hope maybe we'll get one later that's like about bowie the man but this is about bowie the god and dear god i'm like i knew while i was watching this movie i was like i'm gonna see this so many times in my life my kids are gonna see this like this is gonna be my kids intro to bowie like that's cute it's it's incredible so number four moon age daydream wow what's your number three wow we're in the top three now top three the stakes are high now yeah the stakes are really high now and um yeah uh my number (laughs) three is Triangle of Sadness. Oh, you had a little higher than me, yeah. I do have it higher than you because while I was watching it, to be fair, I had had like three glasses of wine in a very <laughs> quick order. But while I was watching it, at least the first like hour, I was like, this is the best movie I've seen in like so long. And it is, it was, it, yeah. it was, it wasn't just the wine. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, one of the best theatrical experiences I've had this year, maybe even the best, it was a full theater. I saw it at the Vintage Las Feliz. Really, I just love seeing movies there. It's so great. And like, yeah, the first hour is so wild and everyone was laughing. Such good vibes. Um, it does something so well where it's like it's social satire, but it's never straying too far from reality. And I think that's the key for me for satire. It's that sweet spot. Nashville has it. Mm. It's exactly what I was talking yeah. about with Nashville. It's a sweet spot where it's like this is theoretically rational and possible. Yes, it's kind of exaggerated, but it's exaggerated for dramatic purposes, not to like bluntly poke fun at something you know what i Interesting. mean Interesting. i feel like i maybe slightly disagree i feel like his satire is so aggressive you think but but in i don't know if it's the way that the dialogue is delivered or the dialogue itself there is something in it that feels like theoretically possible to me right well yeah sure <laughs> no, <laughs> no, is... no no no. i mean uh, it doesn't feel satire it doesn't feel really like bluntly satirical mm. I don't know what it is. I think it's in the performances. I think it's in the writing, like the whole thing. I think it's his direction. Yeah. I think there's maybe only one or two characters that he actually cares about in that movie. Which ones? Um, I forget her name, but the cleaning woman on the ship. Abigail. Abigail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like that might be the only character that he cares about in the movie. Cause everyone Probably. else is kind of like, is a grotesque caricature. Yeah. I mean, they're caricatures, yes, but I also, I don't know, I think in the, there's something in the direction where it's like, as the scenes are playing out, they're not like wildly like satirical to me, but it's a sweet spot. It's a very, it's something I can't quite pinpoint. Uh-huh. Um, 
but it just like ev- this eat the rich format is so popular right now it's such a popular genre but i think that this is genuinely funny and genuinely compelling in the power dynamics like i like that it sticks to comedy i know that you said it switches a lot of things but it doesn't genre ben i think it's funny from start to finish mm-hmm. and i think that that is so commendable um i love parasite parasite does the genre shift so well but yeah i think there's something so interesting about maintaining comedy and i think this does it so well even in the end and i also love how the end is very subtle like it's not this grandiose like crazy thing that we see the end is so quiet and i really like that about it and yeah dolly um dolly de leon who plays abigail so on point she's incredible. so on point yeah incredible so funny yeah. so weird i really really was into it yeah it's great I will say that I did start watching White Lotus because my wife literally would not leave me alone. And what White Lotus does, again, I'm enjoying it. It's perfectly like it's it's well made and it's entertaining. But what what takes like White Lotus a season to do, like Triangle of Sadness does more potently in a in a film. Totally. So yeah, but that is a very po- that whole eat the rich thing is like very very so popular. Pressing it right now. Yeah. But I think this is like this and Parasite are like the best examples. I think. Did you see the Square? His last movie. No, with Elizabeth Moss. I'd be curious to see. It's if you love this, you're gonna love that. Like they're both cool. great. Um, yeah, nice. Yeah. What is your number three? My number three. We saw this together. This is the Memoria. Memoria. Yeah. So yeah, this is the Thai filmmaker Joe. I'm not gonna pronounce his try uh, even attempt to pronounce his name because I'm not gonna get it right. Joe, who made Uncle Boon Me and mm-hmm. all those great films, Cemetery of Splendor. Um. This is great. So it's just, it's so my kind it of movie. It was really movie. good. I, I didn't mention it because it came out, actually, US release was like 2021 December. Well, that was when it, so this one's tricky because essentially <laughs> it toured. So Neon has yes, it in the US and yes. Neon said it's only going to play in one theater at a time in the country. I'm so, so glad we saw it's it. It's like a touring yeah. expo and it literally goes from theater to theater. So it did not come to LA. It was at like a festival like Beyond Fest or AFI Fest in 2021. But I feel like festivals, I didn't count festivals as like mm-hmm. the release. Mm-hmm. It literally the first time if you lived in LA that you could see it was in 2022. So mm-hmm. that's why I counted it mm-hmm. and haha jokes on them i literally have the blu-ray sitting on my shelf because i imported it from the uk where neon <laughs> does not have distribution um because i knew as i was watching it, i was stressed out i'm like am i never gonna see this again like <laughs> <laughs> uh it's great i'm a big fan of his movies i think he is one of the handful of truly truly next level filmmakers we have working right now I've loved everything he's done. And this was just, again, it's almost a more palatable story. Again, because Tilda Swinton, this is, you have I have two Tilda, I have two Tilda movies on my 10. list. So, you know, because most of the film is in English, I think it's, you know, for people who don't want to read subtitles, uh, it's a little bit more palatable maybe than like Uncle Boon Me. Um, and a little bit more grounded than Uncle Boon Me, which is like, you know, apparitions are appearing and all that stuff. This is more grounded. But the essential gist, if you haven't seen Memoria, is Tilda Swinton is being, she keeps hearing this loud banging noise. And it first happens, it wakes her up in the middle of the night and she just hears it throughout her life. And she's like, where's the sound coming from? And so it's about her journey. Um, I think the movie takes place in Colombia, right? Yes. Because she's like on a dig, like an archaeological dig or something, if I remember correctly. It's been so long. Yeah, we saw it almost a year ago. In I fact, think. I don't even remember. It was crazy. <laughs> I yeah, I just really dig it. I dig these dreamy, you know, so slow dreamy. movies and the fact that you have this mystery, the central mystery. Like she goes to an audio engineer and is she's trying to recreate the sound with him. Yes. I love these kind of like nocturnal, hypnotic. Like I remember when we saw it, we heard this guy snoring in the theater. <laughs> in fact, that guy was <laughs> snoring before the film even started because they start There's with like silence. five minutes of silence yes. or whatever. And he was already, he was already out, so he was like on and off asleep throughout the movie. But you know what? It's kind of like okay. And like, I was freezing, and I was fighting sleep. Oh, were you? Yeah. <laughs> See, being cold for me keeps me like I'm more alert. It's when it's hot that I get tired. Yeah. But yeah, this is great. I, like, I really, really liked it. As I well. really dug it. 
um again i can't wait to show this to my kids you know (laughs) 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 oh my god i'm so sorry for your kids they're gonna have to see so much that they're not gonna like but that's how they're gonna find what they like yeah yeah Um, kids sit down for memoria please (laughs) Can you imagine? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. <laughs> At what age? At what age are you Like three. <laughs> a three-year-old would like this movie. Well, there's nothing inappropriate in the film. Exactly. A three-year-old would love it, <laughs> yeah, I maybe. think. Maybe. Maybe a you know little what? younger. I'm going to try it. No, no, no. I think you should try a little younger. Like, I think two. Like two? As you're trying to lull them to sleep. Yeah. But the banging might be, uh, oh. too, you know, <laughs> they'll start crying or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, what is your number two? My number two. Okay, so these are the really big guns because I think that these two, like all of these movies, I loved. But I think two movies like really stood out and I think will be like on people's like decades lists. And I think that these two might or have like the best chance of all the movies this year. And I also loved them. Um, It's Tar. It's Todd Field's Tar is number two. Nice. And I don't know what to say about a movie that says so much. It says so much about like the modern world, but also like just the theory of power and like that hasn't changed for decades, Uh, but it's also so modern. And I don't like movies with a lot of like texting and stuff, but it so works for me in this. Um, So the conductor, there's a, there's a female conductor. Her name is uh, Marin Alsop. And she's actually mentioned in the movie, like when Tar is sitting down in the beginning for that interview, she mentions all the female co- and conductors who like kind of have had like have had it kind of easy. And uh, she recently came out and she said that she finds the movie offensive, uh, that it's wrong to make the protagonist a female conductor and a predator. But I think that that's like precisely why it's so incredible. And um, it's so like, OK, here's my thing. It's so easy to make a bad man. It's so easy. It's harder to make a bad woman. Sometimes not that much harder, but it's hardest to make a bad woman who should, by our 2022 standards, be a hero. You you know what I mean? Like the most famous conductor in the world and she so happens to be female. Um, But that's not why she's female. That's not why Todd Fields did that as like this cool twist of like, ooh, look at this twist. Actually, she's a female and she's a predator. No, She's female because she just is. And that's why the movie's so good. And that's why I think I love it so much. Like, and even Kate Blanchett, like in an inter- after in response to Marin Alsop, she said, like, power is genderless. And yes, like there's only one movie about a high profile female conductor. And it's unfortunate that a woman in the field feels like this. But I think that from a cinematic perspective, it's such a good choice. Like it's just such an amazing choice on Todd Field's part but again I don't think that was why he made like she just is a woman it's not to do that it's not to have this twist like and it's I find it more empowering for that fact I don't know I I, I'm totally on board with like Kate but I just like obviously you think about that when you're watching the movie and I think it's just it's what makes it so compelling and it's about a downfall like it at its core it's about a downfall and yeah that means like the reason for the downfall is central and that reason is cancel culture which is such touchy subject and i love movies about touchy subjects and like the art versus the artist and that whole juilliard conversation and i just think it's so i was just like glued to the screen like my eyes were just like glued my mind was just like whoa and my ears were just happy (laughs) that's how i can describe um it's set of course in this elegant classy world of classical music which is visually um and audibly pleasing like like i said um but it's the exclusivity of this world that makes the stakes so interesting and that make the character so interesting. And she's just doing so good. Like Kate is just on another level and just the, the script. I think the script is incredible. I have the script. It's only 90 pages for like such a long movie. It's literally 90 pages, which I think is so cool. I haven't read it yet, but I've been, I've been meaning to. Yeah. And you start to think, of course, like when you're watching, you're starting to think about like, and me as a woman, like just watching it, like, and Lydia Tarr as a woman, like, how could she be like this? Is it because like, this is what 
she was used to like in her rise to fame and so she thinks like the generation this generation shouldn't have it any easier does she believe like this is just the burden women have to bear like that she's worked so hard and done so much like like i said like the new people shouldn't have it easy or is she just an asshole or is she just drunk with power like i love that as i'm watching it i'm having all of these thoughts i'm having all these feelings and i think that it's incredible yeah yeah um i know you didn't like it that much but well i i (laughs) it's not that i didn't like it it's that i thought it was way too long and i thought just kind of needlessly (laughs) unfocused at points did you yeah like you're introduced to her and you see her give like a 10 minute interview incredible i don't know you know it's um I I want to see it again because I I didn't dislike the movie, but I felt that like once it kind of became about like cancel culture, I was just like, oh okay. Like I I would have much preferred just like I don't know. Maybe it just felt too topical, like in terms of it could be. But I just like wanted like because I'm so on board from the premise. Like Kate Blanchett plays this classical composer, like a. Uh, She's not a composer, but well, she is a composer. She is a composer. She's a composer and conductor. She's got me got. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, so I was so in for that premise, yeah. and I felt like when they when it kind of became like the cancel story, I was like, oh, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. But then it was the whole rest of the well, movie. Well, it's the downfall, right? And I think that the down, of course, the downfall is due to cancel culture, which is so topical and so. I think it's needed, though. I think it's necessary for filmmakers to talk about really. I do like, too. I do uh, too. Timely subject. Yeah, I do too. And I'm not like anti cancel culture by any means. No, I know, but that's why it's so interesting. And I just, I just think it's really well written. Like really, like the way she talks and the things she says, and even the dreamy sequences. Like the, it's really a psychological drama. Like her kind of, like when she falls and all that these weird kind of dreams she's having and the sounds she's hearing. And yeah, I don't know. Works. I, for me, I just, I never quite got let into her, which is like, I think my biggest complaint, like, and again, I'll, I'll watch this again. I'm not, I don't think it's like bad or anything. I just like was left a little cold by it. And maybe that's kind of the point. Um, and I've liked his previous films too. I liked in the bedroom and little children, but um and Kate's obviously amazing. Kate, like we know her. Kate Blanchett. Mrs. Like Guillermo, my friend. Blanchett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no. I um, And I also didn't really like the look of the film either. It's really? a, a very, very so clean. digital, clean sterile. look. Sterile. Yeah. Which I get. The sterile part. Like, yeah, I don't know. I. But that's what I feel like rich people are, which is why I liked it. It was like. It was like I was watching it and I'm like, yeah, I never want to be at that point. I never want to have a house that feels like a museum. Like that right. is so. And then, of course, she goes to her home that she grew up in in Long Island or something. And it's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll give it another shot. But yeah. as of now, it was it's not on my it's not you one didn't of even the... honorable mention it. No, no. Uh, <laughs> that's so shy. I. Ooh, I love it. I want to watch it actually. Like again, you should. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. What's your See, this two? is why it's so fun. I think we're not going to end up having that much overlap. We but don't. That's, that's we why one. it's so fun. We have well, two. Just wait. We have banshees as well. Uh, you can tell. You're assuming. <laughs> wait. Can I guess your next two? What? Vortex and banshees. No. 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 Well, first of all, don't guess. Don't take the fun out of this. I'm not going to tell you, even if that was right. Uh, no, my next two is a split one. Okay, so my number two, again, I did this. They were separate parts on the on my top ten. Both films were on there. I combined them because they're the same director and because I wanted to fit another film on the list. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of cheating, but I feel like you did it for number ten, so we even it out. Gaspar Noe, number two is my Gaspar Noe. It's Vortex and Lux Eterna. Nice. These were both, again, both of these films were on my top 10. I just combined them so I could make room for another movie because I wanted to let another one in there. Yeah. Both of these are incredible. I think they're both technically from like 2021. I think yeah. Lux Eterna might even be 2020. But again, it did not come to the US until 2022. I was waiting for these films and I couldn't see them until, you know, last summer or whatever it was. And I saw them back to back. I saw, I think I saw Vortex first, and then the next day I saw Lux Eterna because they were playing at the same time. Totally different films, two different sides of Gaspar Noe. I'm a pretty big Gaspar Noe fan, and these films are both like among his best stuff ever, up there with like Climax. I loved these films. 
Uh, Vortex, as you said, it was such a surprising film from him because it's so restrained and like, I read that he had like a near death experience, mm-hmm. like hemorrhoid. he had a hem- yeah. yeah hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, and um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a grown up mature Gaspar Noé film, and it's devastating. So and devastating. the two actors in it are incredible. One of them is Dario Argento in like his first acting role, <laughs> and he's heartbreaking. It's a great film, and again, the split scene, the split screen seems like a gimmick until it's not, and you're like, holy shit, this film is that much more powerful because you're seeing what he's doing he's milling about he's typing on his typewriter on one side of the screen the other side of the screen she's going down and she's going to to the grocery grocery store store. yeah so oh my god it's devastating it's beautiful it's warm-hearted i think it's the first film of his that can be genuinely called like warm really sad even though it's devastating (laughs) but yeah dear god this was almost my number one vortex and then tied lux eterna which is his film his almost short film which is why i felt too okay putting it on here i think it's like 45 or 50 minutes long charlotte gainsburg essentially is an actress and beatrice Dahl is the director and they're talking about witchcraft and they're talking about previous film sets they've been on and they're making this film where charlotte gainsburg is supposed to be burned at the stake and again not giving too much away but it's sort of this behind the scenes drama that ends with the with a classic Gaspar Noe assault on the senses with like this 10 minute strobing light and crazy sound. And I fucking loved it. I'm so <laughs> I'm such a Gaspar Noe boy. Like I can't help it. He's like so provocative. I, and I get why some people would hate Gaspar Noe, but I'm like so there for it. And I'm so there to pay the money to go see this in a theater and like be assaulted, which nice. I, I was. There's like warning signs out front. Love that for you. I want to let uh, Gaspar know I can assault me anytime. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm there to be assaulted. You heard it here first folks. Yeah. So yeah, these were both incredible. Uh, I think I like vortex slightly more, um, but yes, they're both firmly in my top, probably top five of the year. So that might, they're at my number two. So cool. vortex and Lux Eterna. Very nice. But Jackie, I think I know what your number one is. I'm not going to yeah, say it's after sun. Charlotte <laughs> Wells. Um, I think that it's sad to me that you want your friends to like the same movies you like. And it's sad that you didn't like it. And it's sad that it didn't connect with you. I just think that it's such a beautiful, perfect synchronization of form and function. Like, yes, of course. And how you said, like how we remember people and the kind of like the shattered memories and the way that I literally wrote down. Are you ready? I wrote. (laughs) because <laughs> she plays with our senses right and she yeah. played because it's form and function it is because of these memories i literally wrote you watch things in reflection off a camcorder screen a polaroid coming into focus the reflection of a person in a tv but like it's not just a gimmick like you really you get the sensation the feeling of holding hands of dancing of swimming of being a resort at a resort as a kid like and making random friends that you're never gonna see again and uh having a stupid crush you know and it just really, really worked for me. I went and saw it alone. I was quietly sobbing. It just was really... Is that possible for you? Yeah, <laughs> apparently. And it, yeah, it's about how we remember our parents and how they actually are and that they are actual people and how they do things that you genuinely can't understand as a kid. I love how that goes through. And even you couldn't understand. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. such a there is mystery there and there is weirdness and like why is he in a cast? Why did he disappear that night? What did he do? It's the burden this young man carries it and how he carries it and will he continue carrying it and everyone thinks he's her brother and it's just so sad in the way that like he's embarrassed to be the goofy dad because he's so young like and he still has or he thought he had his whole life ahead of him and I don't know. It's the kind of movie that gives you like butterflies, in my opinion. It gave me butterflies. And Paul Meskel, this man is going to break my heart a million times. He's already done it. He is going to break my heart a million times in this lifetime. And I will gladly take it because I just, he's him. Um, So perfect for this part. You know, and I just love that it's like he's playing this really tender father who's, he genuinely wants to be there for his kid. And like he even takes her on an international vacation. Like that's a big commitment. He's so lost himself and it's just so sad. And I don't know. He he he's 
but he's trying like he's recording her with a camcorder like that's such a dad thing but also like he leaves her at night and goes to some party and ugh, i don't know and he wants to talk to her about like love and sex and drugs and you think like hmm, maybe she's a little young for that and it's true like maybe she is but he can't help it like he himself is a kid and I don't know. And I just, I think it's really beautiful. Each scene melts into the next. It really does. And I, I loved that. I don't know. It's tender. It's warm. It's never mushy. And it's brave to have such a simple story. I think that that's really brave. Like nothing really happens if you think about it. Like actually nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and it makes, it's the kind of movie that makes me want a child, but also never want a child. <laughs> if that makes sense. And I love that it turns the cute karaoke trope on its heels. Uh, yeah, I think. No, I, I am certain it's my favorite. Cool. I'm ready to revisit it. I want to own it, but I don't think that there's a U.S. release. I think not yet. Um, Really looking forward to it. And I hope one day you can revisit it. I'll revisit it. Open up your heart and let it melt. What I'm most excited for is her next film. Yeah, me too. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I still think that this is incredible. And like, if I could make that as my first feature, like th- what? I think that's incredible. Yeah. And well, I can't. I already know I can't. That's the thing. Like, I'm watching it and I already know I can't. You can't? No. You can. No, no, no. I can't. <laughs> Why? Because it has a wisdom. Like, I feel oh, like she oh, did oh, her sure. homework so well. And she's very talented. And I'm just, I am excited for her next stuff. But definitely watching it i'm like this is a director who has really good taste and has seen a lot of movies Mm -hmm. and that doesn't come out that much um that doesn't come through that much i feel like especially nowadays um so charlotte wells really like you cool what's your number one well you're you're not alone in that a lot of publications i was looking at film comment and stuff and after sun is like number and usually in the top three so it's beautiful i'm in the minority with that one my number one, you know, it's Martin McDonough's Banshees of Inna Sharon. Nice. I knew while I was watching this, I'm like, nothing this year is going to top this. Nice. It has everything. It does have everything. It has everything. And I mean, it doesn't really have romance. I th- I would beg to differ that the relationship, I mean, there's not like sexual romance, but like that the relationship between the two friends is romantic. Yeah. Um, Absolutely love this film. I am a pretty big Martin McDonough fan. And it's funny because... Everyone seems to agree that In Bruges is great, but then every film after that, people are like, oh, no, I don't like, like, strangely, Three Billboards very, like, has a big backlash. Yeah. I loved Three Billboards, and I don't get people that didn't like it. This is his best film. This is his best film. And I even rewatched In Bruges, I think, just after this, because I hadn't seen it in a while. And I was like, wait, is it as good as In Bruges? And I rewatched In Bruges. It's still good, but like Banshee's by far the better film. And it's just so cool, like Gaspar Noe, it's cool to see a filmmaker continue to evolve and mature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without getting too personal, you know, I've dealt with things in life where you have to break off a, you know, a friendship with somebody or whatever. And when I found out that this film was about that, I was like, oh my God, that's what the movie's about. And what a cool way to do it. I Such mean, a cool way. I Martin know. McDonough, you know, started as a playwright mm-hmm. and still writes plays. Of course, I don't know, he's also with Phoebe Waller Bridge. Like that, that duo of Phoebe Waller Bridge and Martin Incredible. McDonough. Are you kidding me? That really, that's, that's <laughs> some crazy stuff. That's yeah. like, that's like the British Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, but yeah, this was, um, it's just on another level. Like it's his best film. And, also, Colin Farrell, who, you know, I'm flashing back to 20 years ago. I didn't like at all. I didn't like him, like, in Minority Report and stuff when mm-hmm. he was, like, young and hot. And I just thought he was, like, a dick. <laughs> and what he's become such a I fascinating actor. He's in two of my, he's also in 13 Lives. So he's he, in After Yang. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. He's had a good year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's continuing to do really great work. And I think he his is. character in this. So good. It's so good. And I have such a soft spot for these types of characters. These kind of like, I don't want to say dim witted. They are. But they're kind of slow. Like, you know, I, I love those kinds of like naive not super bright characters. I don't know why. And there's why. two in this. Like there are two. Well, oh yes, Barry Dominic. Kilgan. Yeah, yeah. Um <laughs> but yeah, the performance from Colin Farrell. I mean, Brendan Gleeson is great too. Yeah. But Colin Farrell like showing a certain vulnerability that I don't think he's showed yet. Yes. And 
Yeah, it's incredible. Like the, you know, the island it was shot on, it looks incredible and it's always gloomy and the writing is just so, so good. And yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ. It's my, it's, it was definitely my favorite. Wow. Um, incredible film. It and is. It, I loved it. It's getting buzz for good reason. It's not, you know, hopefully, again, we don't know what the Oscar noms are, but hopefully it does well because it'll it, probably win screenplay. It deserves it. The screenplay is incredible. Yeah. And the filmmaking is just, you know, Martin McDonough's style is is interesting. Some people think he has no directorial style. I don't think that's the case, but his scripts definitely do like all the talking. He's a playwright. He's a playwright. And um, he's, he's great with actors. Like his performances are always like really, really good. And yeah. This, this, great choice. This did it for me. I love this movie. Yay. Yeah. We're in agreement. Yeah. Sorry. My number one is white noise the noah bomb box <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> but the less said about that the better <laughs> i did see it i did i did um yeah, yeah. um yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's our top 10 that's our top 10 so we so we had eternal daughter crossover yeah, and eternal banshees daughter, is that it triangle of sadness oh triangle of sadness we had vortex, three oh yeah and banshees Oh yeah, so but we th- doubled up, so it's kind of we was, messed each other up. We still had like four or five overlaps, <sighs> which is almost half. No, it's not though, because we each doubled. Well, so like, really, we're working off of uh, 11, 22 yeah. movies, right? And so we only had four overlap. Well, no, you wouldn't wait. Oh, wait. I wait. <laughs> the math is confusing me now. <laughs> we well, had enough. Although, you know. What did you think of 2022? You know what? I'll be completely honest. Not the strongest. Me too. I year. agree. I agree. Totally. Because I'm thinking back to like 2017 when we had like "Call Me by Your Name," "Phantom Thread," yeah. Like, and I was like, "Whoa." Um. Yeah. Not. I. You know. I. The top ten of the the movies I just listed. I really like all of those. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think other years. I agree. It's. It wasn't like a weak year, but it wasn't a strong year. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. Was it stronger than last year? You know what? We were talking the other day about what the other Oscar noms were. We forgot Licorice Pizza of last year. Oh, yeah. Remember we were talking? We were trying to like think what were the other things that were nominated. Yeah, like Coda won over Licorice Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, yeah, not, I, I agree with you. I don't think it was a very strong year overall. Um, Some years it's like tumbleweeds. Like you, yeah. You're lucky to find one or two really great films. Mm-hmm. This year wasn't that case, but it wasn't like a strong year. Yeah. So, it was no 1999. What about the year that No Country for Old Men and 2007. There Will Be Blood came yes, out? Yes, I remember that vividly. That's 2007. crazy. What are we doing next week? Next week, we are doing The Godfather. Oy so, we're going back to the list. We're doing The Godfather. I'm very excited because I just saw The Godfather exhibit at the Academy Museum. Oh, so you did? I'm all revved up. I'm ready to go. I'm always down to watch The Godfather, so it should be fun. Cool. Well, we hope you enjoyed our top 10 of the year. Yes. You know, feel free to get in touch, whether you yeah, agree or hear, disagree. We'd or... love to hear your top 10s. Uh, comment on our Instagram post. Send us an email. Yeah, you could light our ass up, too, if you want. You yeah, know, like... that, too. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, until next week, I'm Greg. I'm Jackie. We'll see you next time. Bye. Seen and Heard is an official podcast of the Arroyo Film Club featuring Greg Kleinschmidt and Jacqueline Postagion. Theme music by Andrew Cox. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. If you have any questions, comments, or you just want to say hi, email us hello at seenandheardpod.com or visit our website, www.seenandheardpod.com.